Thank you very much, Ingwil, and I'd like to invite Dr. Ian Birdsell for his talk, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards. How are you all doing? Are you okay? It's been a long day. I've always wanted to wear one of these. I want to ask you if I can take your order. Um, <laughs> I should be across the road. Now, um, I'm the last thing in the day. I'm a bit different. I'm not going to tell you lots of statistics. I'm not going to tell you all sorts of different things like that. We're going to have a bit of a conversation about education. Uh, I'm going to walk around a bit because otherwise I get a bit agitated. And uh, somebody bought me a beer. It wasn't my idea, but it seems a shame to waste it. Um, so uh, it is the end of the day. Now, can I just, before I crack on, how many of you speak good English? The people who don't put their hands up obviously don't understand the question, I've realized. Uh, okay, so if I speak at this pace, is that okay? You're all good with that? Okay, good. I talk quite fast, you see. So uh, this is who I am, and I'm gonna talk to you about something called FOMED, and we'll come on to that in just a second. It became very apparent to me earlier today that the place I work is very different to the place that you all work, uh, not just because I'm in England and you're in Austria and other places, but the department I work in. So I'm a clinical director and the consultant of Southampton Emergency Department, what we call an A&E department in the old-fashioned sense. Um, but that's a place where everybody and anybody can come to us with their illness, their injury. It's free at the point of delivery. We have this famous National Health Service, and we have consultants in emergency medicine. So I'm a consultant, I did a training program in emergency medicine, I did specialty training in that, I did exams in that, so I'm a consultant in emergency medicine. I'm not an anaesthetist, um, I know quite a lot of people here are, uh, and I think they're really great. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but so I'm an emergency physician, and I do a different type of job to what you get here. I do also go out on the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Air Ambulance, so we have pre-hospital emergency medicine in the UK. We have about uh, 16 air ambulance services. That's a doctor, paramedic, pilot model. So I go out and do that sometimes too. Um, so I do pre-hospital care and I do a bit of emergency medicine as well. Or quite a lot of emergency medicine. Uh, I'm from Southampton. Uh, that's the south coast of England. And this is how long it took me to get here. Uh, 306 hours it took me to get here. Um, that's about, if you don't sleep, 37 days. So I set off at the end of January and I'm quite tired. But it was nice. I went through some nice places. Stuttgart was a highlight. So that was, uh, that was worth doing. Now, just want to ask, does anyone know what FOMED is? One person. Okay, well, isn't that good? You came to a talk where you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. How about who knows what social media is? Okay. Now, social media is this big thing that's exploded in the last few years. It's Twitter, it's Facebook. Twitter has 974 million people who use it. Facebook has over a th one billion people have a Facebook account. It's humongous, and social media can fit in all these different things, all these different types of applications. And when you talk about social media, some people can get a bit turned off by that. Social media sounds a little bit like you find out if you know, Justin Bieber's been to the toilet or you know, that sort of thing. Or, or you can find out you know, what perhaps one of your most famous residents is up to. Um, and I was very interested in Arnold. He's, there you go. He built a wall in Venice. <clears throat> My life is now complete. So why is it called FOAM? Well, it's free, open access, educational, medical education. In 2012, a guy called Mike Cadogan, who's an emergency physician in Australia, was at the Dublin ICEM, that's the International Convention for Emergency Medicine, and he was sat around with a beer of an evening with some like-minded people, and they were talking about social media. The next day, he was gonna do a talk a bit like this about social media, but they all agreed that social media is a bit of a turn-off. So they needed to come up with a new, new phrase for it, so they called it FOMED. And so the hashtag that is used on Twitter is FOMED. You might say, well, why don't they just call it FOAM? Well, because if you put FOAM into Google, you tend to get lots of pictures like this. So they called it FOMED. So that's what we're talking about. So what is FOMED? So FOMED is really a combination of blogs and podcasts. That's the two major things it is, really. So blogs are just really 
created by whoever wants to make them. There's millions of these now. If you want to go off and write something on the internet and have lots of people read it, you can do that. You don't have to put it into a newspaper. You don't have to submit it to a magazine. You don't have to even be very good at writing. You can make yourself a blog. Anyone can do it. Podcasts are a bit like blogs, except they're the audio version. So it might be somebody just speaking into a microphone. A single person, that can be quite hard to get people to want to listen to you just speaking. Or it can be a conversation. It's like a radio show. And you can do that yourself. You don't need very expensive equipment. You can do that yourself. And what happened was people realized that we're all making educational materials. We all do PowerPoints and we all do stuff in our hospitals and in our communities. But then they sit on our hard drives and you don't share them. So the idea was, what if we just shared all this stuff and we did it for free? because we're all altruistic and stuff. And we did it for free, and we shared it, and people could use it when they wanted to. And so that was the idea behind FOMED. Now, FOAM has exploded over the last few years, and these are just some of the people who do podcasts and blog sites. Now, these are all emergency medicine, critical care type things. We'll come at the end to how this might be relevant to you in your daily practice. This is the one I'm involved with down here called St. Emlyn's. It's... Um, a virtual hospital. What we did is instead of saying Southampton, or some of the guys I work with work in Manchester, instead of saying at Manchester, where you get into all these problems with confidentiality and all these other things, we created a whole virtual world called St. Emlyn's. So this is a virtual hospital where we can treat patients and we can discuss cases that are made up and we can do all sorts of things. So we have St. Emlyn's. And these are all other really good sites where you can go and you can read about things or you can listen about things. And we'll talk about why that's important. Now, blogs and podcasts have grown exponentially over the last 10 years or so. Barely even existed way back here. And now we're up to, this is just emergency medicine and critical care. Okay, this isn't anesthesiology on its own. This isn't ENT. This, isn't orth this is just emergency medicine and critical care. So there's now 275 blogs and podcasts that are available. So loads of stuff out there that's free, that today, with your phone, with the, by the way, the internet connection here is amazing. You don't get that at every conference. With that, you can go and look at this stuff today. You don't have to pay anything for it. It's free. Now, these are happening in all sorts of different languages. I think 17 different languages, something like that. Now, you'll notice up here, German, don't like to point it out, but you're lagging behind the English a bit. We do like to point out when the Germans are lagging behind the English. So really, there's a real opportunity for the German speakers amongst you to get in there, to start thinking about writing blogs in German. Podcast, an emergency medicine podcast in German. Think of that. And here you are in Austria. So a couple of brave souls doing their blog in Austria. You'll notice down here, actually, it's not, you know, the UK, we've got 19. The USA, they can't stop talking about themselves, can they? It's just about... So it's 102 sites generally about themselves. But uh, no, there's a lot of good stuff coming out of America as well. Now, how do you know that the stuff, this is one really common thing. People say, well, how do I know if it's any good or not? How can I trust whether or not the thing I'm looking at is worth reading? How do I know that what you're telling me is true? Well, how do you know that anything that you're told is true? How do you know that Christoph did a great lecture earlier today, and he did some great slides, and I have to say he spoke with a degree of authority, and I thought he probably knows what he's talking about. But how do you know that that's true? You have to go away, you're intelligent people, and you look at it, and you think about it, and you come to your own conclusions. People say, well, well all this stuff on the internet, they're just, it could be mumbo jumbo. You're bright people. They don't let just anybody do the jobs we do. So you can go away, you can think about it, go to other sources. If we're talking about papers online, we always encourage people to go back to the original paper. Read the paper itself, critically appraise it for yourself, but then listen to other people's opinions. It's just like having a big community of people that you can dis dis discuss stuff with. There's two sides to education. There's the learners and there's the educators. And we kind of intermingle. So I'm here doing a talk, but I've been learning loads. So there's times when I'm a learner and there's times when I'm an educator. But we'll just talk a little bit about how foam and can work for you as a learner. So somebody who wants to learn. So why do doctors learn stuff? I'm not keen on audience participation at the end of the day, because you go, so let me ask you. And everyone just goes, <laughs> so I'm just going to have an excuse to have a sip of my beer. And I'd like you to think, why is it that you learn? What, what is it? You've come to a conference, so you've, you're kind of wanting to learn. But what is it that makes you think about learning? I don't know what will happen here. Anyone? I know what I'll do. I'll keep drinking the beer until somebody gives me. No, that's dangerous, isn't it? That's what happened last night. 
Okay, can, why do you learn? Patient safety, okay, that's a really altruistic kind of idea. Patient safety, what, we want to do patient safety, but why is it that you learn? What is it that makes you go and look up something on an evening after a shift? What, do you, what happens? Curiosity. curiosity would be lovely. I would love if my doctors that I worked with were curious, but we're not. We work hard. We're curious sometimes. These are some of the reasons I think. Now, you might think it's because I'm a negative Englishman, but I think people learn stuff because they have to do exams, so they go and read a book, they might have been challenged on the shop floor where somebody like me, their consultant, said, so, tell me the 10 causes of clubbing. I've never said that in my life, but anyway. <laughs> they might have been asked by their seniors. They might have made a mistake. So we often learn in medicine traditionally by making mistakes. It's not a good way to learn, really, because we'd rather learn first and not make the mistake in the first place. And if you ask lots of people who are doing talks, a lot of the reasons why they've learned stuff is because they were doing a talk. So they were asked to tell you something, so they've gone to learn about it. This is all reactive learning. Reacting to a situation so you go off and learn. Now, what I'd like to promote to you is that this FOMED idea can make you proactive learners. You can become active, you seek out knowledge, learning stuff that you didn't actually have to learn. It just makes you a better doctor or nurse, paramedic. It just makes you better at what you're doing. Now, the other great thing about all of this online stuff you can do it whenever you like. So if there's a podcast that you want to listen to, you don't have to sit in a room as a group like this. You can do it when you're going out for a run, or when you're walking the dog, or when you're in the bath, or when you're in the bath with the dog, or you know, all manner of different things. You can learn whenever you want. You don't have to be in a group. And when you've got busy jobs like we have, it's very hard to get together in a group to do learning together. Our teaching sessions at the hospital we do for our doctors we can almost never get them all in the same room because they're on shifts, they're working nights, some of them are on leave. This way you can do the same thing for everybody, but they can choose when they do it. There are nights when you think, I'm a bit tired, actually, I'm going to go and watch CSI Miami. And there's other nights where you think, do you know what, I might learn something. You can choose, you're in control of your education. There's this other idea of the flipped classroom. This idea that instead of you turning up to a teaching session and the person standing up in front of you and telling you knowledge, you could learn that beforehand in your own time when you're walking the dog. And then when you go to the teaching session, you can explore that with the group. So you might do a session, say, about coagulation. So you might have listened to Christoph's lecture, and you might listen to it on while well, you're just going for your run. And you've listened to the thing on your run, and then you go into your teaching session that's planned, and you do some case-based discussion based on what you've already learned. So you're already two steps ahead. And this isn't anything new. FOMED isn't reinventing education. This isn't fantastic stuff. And there's still a place for the textbooks and the shop floor-based teaching and all that other stuff. It's just an addition to all those other things. Now, Twitter. How many of you have got a Twitter account? OK. How many of you use it? OK. So I'd like to promote to you that Twitter can be a force for good and for learning as well. Again, lots of people think it's mainly about Arnie and whether he's built a wall or whether Justin Bieber's been to visit a children's home or who's number one or all these other things. And it's about self-promotion. But there's a real community in emergency medicine who are present and active on Twitter discussing stuff all the time. So if you follow the right people and they're not hard to find, then you'll find that things are promoted into your Twitter feed. Is everyone happy with how Twitter works? It's a micro-blogging site. So you have this feed of people that you think have something worthwhile to say. And every time you open up the app on your smartphone, you'll just get a list of these things these people have said. It's limited to 140 characters. Suits people like us with a short attention span. And so you just have a quick look, and you think to yourself, oh, that's quite interesting. And maybe it'll have a link to it. And so you might follow the link. It might be somebody, say, here today, who was talking about a talk they were in, and you missed it because you chose to be in here. Good choice. You chose to be in here, and you're not in the one down the road, and you look at Twitter, you think, oh, I missed that. That's interesting. I'll have a look at that. Twitter can be a really useful thing to do, and it is also a way of forming what we'll talk about in a bit, which is a community. Now, what I want to do is just illustrate this for you by using a case example. How many people have heard of this thing? Yeah, so it came out a couple of weeks ago. It's really good beer, isn't it? You do lots of good things in Austria, but you make good beer. Um, it's Friday night, isn't it? Oh, drunk already. So, you, um, how many of you have heard of this thing? 
Okay, so this came out on the 23rd of February. We're now the 1st of April. You might think I am your April Fool. The 23rd of February, and this was published, quite a new thing, quite a big deal. Anyway, in the old days, when this sort of thing came out, imagine your Manny Rivers in, was it 2003, Manny Rivers did the first thing about goal-directed therapy? And in order to know about goal-directed therapy, you had to go to the library to get the paper out, to read the paper. You probably had to photocopy it off the journal because you weren't allowed to take the journal out of the library. And then you might go and see, and, but it was all a big faff. Now we've got things published online, and then what we have is people talking about them straight away. Something we call just knowledge translation. So in the old days, we used to think that knowledge translation, the time between discovering something and it becoming active on the shop floor, took somewhere between 10 and 15 years for knowledge translation. The idea that you've done your work, you've published your paper, you think you're going to change the world, it takes a decade to get that into day-to-day -day practice. What we want to do with all of this stuff is shorten that down, spread the information so people know it sooner and they know it quicker. So Lauren Westerfer and Jeremy Faust, they're two Americans, they're good people. They do something called Foamcast, really excellent podcast. All of these things are in English, but you're all okay with that, so that's good. And the day, what day was this? Oh, I haven't got it on it. This was the day that it was, the, the paper was published. So the paper was published on the 23rd of February in JAMA online, and on the very same day, they produced a 20-minute podcast highlighting the bits of the paper that they thought were worth conversation. They'd actually got hold of the paper early, and so they'd recorded the podcast before that was distributed. Now, I know Jeremy and Lauren. I think they're great people, and I really trust what they say. They're really thoughtful people. And um, I got to hear about that on the day it was published. I started thinking about this sepsis thing really early. Then you've got blog posts coming up, and you'll notice the dates here. So 24th of February there, 23rd of February, this is St. Emily's, Rich Card and somebody I work with. They did a blog post about it. Again, not reams and reams of information, but just something about it. It's all about QSOFA and replacing SIRS and all that other stuff. And then Salim Razai, who's in America, he did something as well. This is all within 48 hours of the paper coming out. So by now, I saw on Twitter that this was happening. My podcast downloaded into my feed automatically. So I saw on Twitter, that I, I listened to the podcast while I was driving to work. Okay, thought I know a bit more about this. I went to seek out the paper. I had a read of the paper, and it was all linked to by these blog sites. And then I had a look at the blog post and thought what other people were thinking about it. And by the end of February, I already know about QSOFA, and I know about SIRS, and I've had some thoughts about it, and I'm thinking about whether or not I'm going to change my practice or not. And then you've got people like Scott Weingart. Scott is an American critical care physician. He's a really great guy. He's probably at the forefront of podcast manufacturing. He's got a really good podcast called MCRIT. Goes quite far with his ideas of what he's doing, but there's 150 of them there. And if you've never listened to any of them, you can go back and listen to all 150. It's like discovering that the West Wing was on and then having all seven series to watch on the box set. Can you imagine that? How many of you watched the West Wing? Imagine if you could unwatch the West Wing and watch it again. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? It's like Scott Weingart. So you can go back. He's got 150 podcasts, which you can learn at your leisure about stuff. But look who he's got on here. It doesn't say on there, actually. He actually did an interview with Merv Singer, who's the primary author of the paper that he's talking about. So this isn't just Scott talking about it. It's the guy who wrote the blooming paper. And you can listen to that. Imagine, how would you have spoken to Manny Rivers in 2002? You'd have had to write to him in America and say, can I possibly come and visit you? And it's not going to happen, is it? So Scott did a one with Merv Singer. Then with a second author, he did a follow-up podcast to answer extra questions that people had asked on Twitter and his blog site about what had happened in this paper. We're only at April the 1st. This is only five weeks ago. And already there's all this information that you can access. Let me remind you, for free. It's not even costing you anything. So why wouldn't you give it a go? There's all sorts of good things about social media, FOMED. There's also, I mean, I'm, the only reason I'm here is because of social media. No one would have heard of contacting me before. Uh, you might think, well, you know, <laughs> there's pros and cons. But you can form communities and groups wherever you are. You can have multinational, international conversations with like-minded people. You can ask questions of them. So just this afternoon, there's a Twitter conversation going on about emergency medicine in Europe. 
And there's a guy called Yuri Yordanov, who's a uh, guy in Paris. He was actually one of the doctors after the Paris attacks. He led the emergency department response in one of the hospitals nearest to the bomb site. And he's active on Twitter. And he's talking a bit about what's happening in Europe with emergency medicine and emergency departments. Apparently, there's a judicial review happening in Spain about emergency medicine. Who knew? I learned that 10 minutes I was listening to you talk. I learned that 45 minutes ago. <laughs> So there's all these things, there's all these benefits that you can get, and none of it will cost you anything. You can pick it up when you want it, you can drop it when you don't want it, you can be part of it and be really involved and be part of the conversation. If you're just more introverted, you can sit and listen. You don't have to be communicating, you don't have to be making stuff. If you want to write a blog site, it's not expensive. You can get yourself a relatively cheap site, almost free when you start off, and you can write a blog site. Memories of Graz, 2016 could start with it today. There's no reason why not. And then you can share your knowledge and your experience with other people. The other thing about podcasts is that if you make a podcast, you can actually end up getting quite a few people listen to you. So we make a St. Emlyn's podcast, and we've done quite a few of them. I think they're all right. And uh, we've done one with Yuri talking with him about Paris. We've done all sorts of different stuff. But actually, we get probably a couple of thousand people, maybe up to 5,000 people listen to our podcast. Think of the reach you can have if you make a podcast. It's lovely talking to a room full of people, it really is. But just think about what you can do to give people that idea, the, your ideas, the things that you're sitting there thinking about, you can share them, share them with the world now. So social media is a great thing. I want to promote it to you as an idea. It doesn't replace traditional education. It will never replace the textbook. There's nothing nicer than having a textbook on your shelf, is there? It gives you a real feeling of authority. You really know what you're talking about. I've got Rosen on my shelf, all three volumes. 180 pounds it cost me 10 years ago, but it's brilliant. It looks beautiful. And I think there's some writing inside it that's worth reading, but it looks beautiful. Textbooks are there. Shop floor teaching is important. That's there too. This is just some of an addition to something else you can have that will enthuse you, that will make you passionate about your specialty, will introduce you to new friends, and can only be really something that's good. Now, I've put this up because Rick Boddy, who's a guy that I work with, who currently is speaking in Baltimore about troponin. If you want to follow Rick on Twitter right now, you can find out all about high-sensitivity troponin. He's a, a world authority on it. He's part of the organizing committee, and this is just down the road. You have no excuse not to go to USEM in Vienna. And you'll see lots of people there who are into this kind of thing. And you'll see lots of the Twitter stuff happening and all sorts of things going on in Vienna. So I just want to promote that to you. So foam, why do we do it? We do it for all the reasons I've talked about, but mainly because it's a bit of fun. We have some tough times. We talk about cardiac arrest. We talk about people bleeding to death. We have tough jobs. This is quite hard. What we do is hard. This is a way of just making it a bit more fun a degree of fellowship, being in it together, sharing stuff together. You've nothing to lose because it's not going to cost you anything. So why don't you give it a go and see if it's something that you want to be involved with. And you can come and join the phone party. Thank you very much for having me. I was delighted to be invited. It's a beautiful country. Thank you so much. And I'm hoping that there'll be a couple more of those now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you. Is there any questions from the audience for now? If you want to know what I drink, I just drink these ones. And I'll have one whenever you want me to get me one. So if that was the question, it's very straightforward. No? OK. So what is the best entry point for foam? Is it oh, okay. via a podcast feed or podcast feed? Or Okay, so I think that's a really important thing. So there's all this stuff out there and people describe it as being like drinking from the fire hose. So the idea that you've got this massive thing and you're trying to get in there and you don't know where to start. For some people, there's these theories about how we learn. So some people enjoy listening to stuff. Some people enjoy reading stuff. Some people have a really short attention span. Each of these different things can suit different people. And what I would say is dip your toes into little bits of all of it and you'll find the bits you like. Give Twitter a go. Don't invest too much time in it at the start. See if you like it. See how you interact with people. Podcasts, 
the, the ones I've put up there are probably the high impact ones that are there before. And actually, I'm a, when I've finished, I'm about to press go on a blog post on St. Emlyn's that has this talk on it and also the German translation of this. It's done by Google Translate. It could say anything. Um, but it's also got some podcast links at the bottom and some links to how you can discover foam. And that's all on St. Emlyn's. So if you just Google St. Emlyn's, then you'll find that. And uh, literally, as soon as I get off, I'll press go and it'll be there. Dip your toe in the water. See what you find. For some people, this doesn't work. I have colleagues at work that think this is a load of nonsense, and they don't enjoy it. But for other people, it can almost be career changing. So there's all sorts of things that I've had that have happened with me and my colleagues and others that I do this stuff with, that without this thing, I would never would have got the opportunity. And I never would have met these people. So just dip your toes in the water, and, and you'll, you might like it. And if you do, then come along. For me, as a non foam ad user, it would seem quite difficult to perceive how do you distinguish opinion, even if it's qualified opinion, from evidence based facts? Uh, would you comment on this? Yeah, well, this is a big fear. Everyone worries about this because they worry that, that people don't critically appraise what they're reading, that they mindlessly hear about something. And there's this curve of when we adopt things. So we tend to be early adopters, innovators and early adopters. We're, we're not as emergency doctors, and our, my, our mentality is there's something new, let's do it. Fibrinogen, something new, I tell you what, that sounds great. Until I met Christoph last night, I hadn't even heard of it. I'm going to go back to my hospital and find out when we can get it. Sounds brilliant. I'm an early adopter, but I need to have that filter, because the intelligence to go back and stop and say, well, I thought Christoph was a really good guy. I'm going to go and look at the papers about that. So it's a very personal thing. You have to have some discipline to not suddenly, there is a worry that a junior doctor or a medical student reads something or hears something. Scott Weingart says something about Reboa. Reboa is very sexy, isn't it? Have you got Reboa here yet? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, retrograde endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. Stick a massive great wire in somebody's groin, inflate a balloon, stop them bleeding to death. <laughs> Whoa, how sexy is that? Or ECMO, and, and uh, ECMO is another Fomed joy at the moment. There's a whole podcast based on ECMO. So you've just got to be careful. You won't find many podcasts about how to wash your hands. But washing your hands will probably save globally more lives than learning about Reboa and ECMO. So be mindful that when you're looking at this stuff, it does go down to the sexy end of the spectrum. It doesn't focus on the other stuff. Have said, so, 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 St. Eminence, I'm really proud. We do a well being stream. We've done quite a lot about feelings. I, I have to say, I'm English, so I do my feelings thing with an Australian called Liz Crow, because, well, she's Australian. We're, neither of us are renowned for feelings. Anyway, we get together and talk about feelings. So we do have all this other stuff there as well. But you just have to be mindful first of who is it you're listening to? Just like today, you've looked at who was the person doing the talk. And then also, don't just get distracted by the sexy stuff, because actually just being a really good doctor, nurse, paramedic, doing the basics well, may be just as good as learning how to do Reboa. Does that make sense? It does. Good. God, my answers will get longer the more of this I have. <laughs> I, I won't have any more. I have another question to you, Ingvild. Yeah. Why are the Norwegians so keen on reporting? What is the point behind having cardiovascular disease, which at least in Austria has a very, very high prevalence, um, and what is being reported um, to, uh, is the government apparently so why do you, for example, report cardiovascular disease to your government? We don't like it. And we don't agree. We don't like going in queues. We don't like doing what our neighbors does. But I think the big issue here is that somebody had a very good idea in 1951 and got something through before we had all these very intelligent thinkers. So this, this started a long time ago. It, it's no quick fix. It takes time. Um, but our government, we, we only have 5 million inhabitants and we're outside the EU, which means we, we sometimes need to do something different. I think this is, uh, Norwegians are, are slightly different. <laughs> it's, it's the only good explanation I have. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know why we do it and our ambulance personnel really sends me the sheets. I ask them to do extra work and they, and they do it. Uh, but I think it's the feedback. Please. 
Please talk into the microphone because it's yes, being no podcasted. Problem. How long does it take to, to register a case? That's a good one. Somewhere between one minute and two hours. Oh, I see. Uh, we say approximately one hour per case because sometimes it's very easy. It takes one minute. Uh, you go there, you find the patient, you start CPR, you stop, it's dead. Uh, and sometimes we act like Sherlock Holmes. We go digging for data, we go searching, we use hours and hours to put together everything. The ambulance was there, the air ambulance was there, there was a volunteer uh, ambulance present. So we might have five partial cases, we might have no information, but we heard about the cardiac arrest. Uh, and these cases take a long time. But approximately one hour manpower to start the registration. And the registration is online or digitally or? or yes, now it paper. is online. <laughs> we have an online-based registration. But the ambulance drivers do not plot it in themselves. They send the paper sheet to one person in their hospital who does the quality control and then puts it in the registry. So in, in all, I think we use about four to five hours per case. But then it's the person treating the patient first, it's the person putting the data in the registry base, it's me doing quality control, sending it back for changes if we need that, and then getting the statistics out. Okay. So it's, it's not a quick job. <laughs> Any other questions? Christoph. Well, regarding the phone party, um, yeah. I mean, I'm on a, a very, very old-fashioned um, email list cons um, concerning anesthesia. It's called Hypeness. Um, and, and what I wanted to say also, whom do, can you trust? You immediately get kind of online peer review mm -hmm. when you post something. Yeah. Um, you get immediately online yeah. peer review, yeah. like either bashing or supporting you. So yeah. I think that's that's also a very good thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. pe people definitely will tell you when they don't think you're right. But <laughs> um, the one thing about a lot of this, as you'll tell from me a bit, it's very positive. So we do tell people when we think we disagree with them, but we do it in a very polite way. The thing about the internet, you've heard of internet trolls, where people just basically decide to have a pop at you because they have nothing better to do with their sad, pitiful little lives. Those people, yes, I'm talking to you and you on the internet. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, but generally, the foam community is really positive. Now, St. Emlyn's, most of the good sites have an internal peer review. So if we want to publish a St. Emlyn's blog post, we have a group of about five or six of us, and at least three of us have to read it and say that we think it's a good idea. And the same with our podcast. So often I'll record a podcast with Simon Carley, who's a professor in Manchester. We'll record it. We'll think it was really great. But we won't publish it until at least two others of the group have listened to it. Because often they'll hear something different. Now, not every site has that. But you're all very bright people. And you'll work out where that peer review is and how it works. But yeah, Twitter is instant peer review. So one of the things that happened about QSOFA was there's a group in South America that didn't like QSOFA. They felt it, didn't, it doesn't work in developing countries as well as it did in the developed world. And they felt that developing countries hadn't been taken into account during the process. And Merv Singer replied to all of that on MCRIT. But that happened immediately via that online presence. So it can be a really effective way of feeding that back. You do have to be, all I would say with all of this is, somebody said on Twitter today, apply the filter between your ears. So here's something, think about it. Don't go and boast to your colleagues at work that you've just learned something brilliant until you think about it a bit, because you might end up looking a bit silly. But generally, the sites you can trust, you'll work out, and so you don't have to worry quite so much, I hope. I've got another question. What's your personal opinion on post-publication peer review, like the same way? Yeah. I, I don't mind any peer review, unless they, so long as they think I'm good. So um, it's a bit like today. If you've enjoyed the talk, I'd love to hear about it. If you didn't enjoy it, then honestly, keep your opinions to yourself. No, um, I think they're all, why shouldn't it be important? We've got an, an age of information We've got where we can communicate better than any other age before us. So why don't we? 
In our hospital, I'm the clinical lead, clinical director for my emergency department. And the thing we've worked out that we can do best to look after our patients is if we talk to our inpatient colleagues more. How many of you have got colleagues on the inter internal service? I don't know, surgeons, internal medicine people where you just don't talk enough. And one of these th things about this is you become very used to talking to people, and, but it's hierarchical-less. For those of you who speak English, that's a made up word. <laughs> okay, there isn't a hierarchy. So you can talk to a professor or a medical student and it's all the same. And I think that openness is really valuable. I think that why wouldn't, if you were proud of your work and you'd done it well, what is there to fear from peer review? Absolutely nothing. If anything, it just adds to your work. So this is just another way that you can do that. Any other questions from the audience? I have to, it's okay. <laughs> I'd like to ask Ingwil one more question. Or uh, We've had a very interesting conversation before about uh, volunteer EMS system and the transition in Norway um, yeah. to a professional system. Also, how this affects reporting, quality control. Maybe you could share this with us in three minutes because I think this would be very interesting for the audience here as we are m momentarily carried by a volunteer EMS system. Yes, um, I can share with you um, what we've done in Norway, and I can say what my personal opinion is about it. Um, we no longer have a voluntary EMS service in Norway. A couple of years ago, the government bought the rest of the ambulances and started paying the people that were working there. So we have no voluntary ambulances being used by the EMS service in Norway. We still have Red Cross ambulances, we still have uh, search and rescue teams from the Red Cross or from uh, the Norwegian People's Aid. We have scouts going on search and rescue missions. So we have a lot of volunteers, but they do not do EMS-related work. Um, this means that when they're part of the Norwegian healthcare system, they have to report cardiac arrest. If we still had a voluntary ambulance service, they could choose not to report. So for me, this is very, very important that we do not have a voluntary service. But my emergency career started in a voluntary ambulance with the Red Cross. So I think they should be taken very good care of, but we need to implement them in a system where education and um, what they do is controlled. I know we, we want to help, we just need to help in the right way. That wasn't three minutes, but I think it would be my answer. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from the audience? We always Thank promise we'd finish on time. That's the most important thing, isn't it? Yes. Finish early. And now I'll it's switch the end of the to German because now the important part comes, the oh. invitation uh, for dinner. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Please, am I not invited? <laughs> Don't worry, I'll just... It's up to you for invitation. <laughs> Hang on. Um, yeah, Google Translate, that's what I need. Vielen, vielen Dank fürs Kommen. Ich habe noch zwei wichtige Punkte. Es hat heute eine Posterpräsentation gegeben. Da gibt es noch einen kleinen Festakt mit den quasi prämierten Posterpreisträgern. Ich hoffe, dass die schon da sind, Michi. Ja. Und dann nachher darf ich Sie natürlich im Rahmen der Kongressorganisatoren zum gemeinsamen Social Event, nicht Social Media Event, sondern richtigen Social Event einladen. Bitte bleiben Sie noch ein bisschen. Es gibt wahrscheinlich was zu essen, wahrscheinlich was zu trinken. No more beer, sorry.